Good morning, everyone. over innovative projects in the UAPB Ag Department um, and it's it's going to cover uh, projects that are geared toward enhancing small farming uh, projects not only here in the United States but in other countries as well. Uh, we're going to have three presenters today and they'll each have uh, 15 minutes to give their presentation and an additional uh, three to five minutes for any questions that you all may have. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Obadiah, uh, Dr. Njui, Obadiah Njui, who's our department chair in the Ag Department. Um, Dr. Njui, uh, his presentation is going to cover Sweet Potato Foundation Program. Thank you, Doc. Okay, good morning. Good morning. I, I don't think I need the mic. Uh, try to be uh, loud enough. I think uh, being in extension, you know how to uh, get to the audience uh, regardless of the system. Uh, I apologize for the few minutes we have started late. Uh, we we're trying to figure out the system, make sure that it's working okay, and we still are. Uh, but uh, since I only have 15 minutes, let me go ahead and just uh, go on and share with you about our Sweet Potato Foundation Seed Program. That is the program at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Uh, and I might need somebody to, to move the slides for me. Columbus, if you mind? Yeah, this is not responding. Uh, okay, the sweet potato production uh, we know in Arkansas uh, and also uh, many other states has been increasing and uh, this is mainly because of the eating healthy move uh, that has been going on and we realize that sweet potatoes uh, are, are, are very nutritious, they are very high uh, in antioxidants, especially the colored potatoes uh, and uh, they have uh, many other benefits and because of the market demand uh, there has been an increase in the need for slips. Arkansas didn't have uh, any slip producers, and our farmers had been going to uh, other states like Louisiana, Mississippi, and some of them as far as North Carolina, which are the three main producing states uh, on sweet potatoes uh, for slips. And that caused uh, problems with, uh, first of all, the, the costs. Uh, travel, the cost of the slips, and more importantly, the quality of the slips. Because once the slips are cut, they have a time period within which they, they have to be planted for them to be well. So uh, to address that, uh, UAPB uh, initiated the foundation seed program uh, to try and address this grower need. And. Uh, uh, Sweet potatoes, okay. uh, we know sweet potato, the way it grows, uh, it's got many challenges, but you can't see by just looking at the field. A good, clean sweet potato field more or less looks like this, but it doesn't tell you exactly what's underground, the quality of the roots and things like that. But sweet potato, because it's propagated vegetatively, not from seed, uh, accumulates viruses over time, and that causes the yield and quality of the crop to deteriorate uh, over time. And sometimes we have to go under the plants to understand how the crop is doing. And basically, and I'll share briefly as uh, a, little, a little later on, uh, the Foundation Seed Program uh, assists the sweet potato growers in the state to monitor their crop and determine how well they are doing. So basically, uh, we go into the field and sample and see how they're doing. This particular plant is not doing well. Uh, this is one slip, and of course, one slip is supposed to produce good potatoes like that, okay? 
uh, you want to see one plant producing that many potatoes. You certainly don't want to see <coughs> this, okay? And this may start right from the quality of the slip uh, and the, 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 the generation of the plant. That is how many times that potato has been replanted over and over again. And uh, basically, that's what we want to see. Okay. Now, the foundation seed program begins with the field selection, where we go out in the field, uh, our farm mainly, and we select for plants that have the best quality potatoes okay, uh, during harvesting. We mark those, and we isolate them and grow them in the greenhouse. Before we start the process, you have to make sure that those roots are the right size as defined by the market. And these are, that is plants that produce the, the most US number ones. That is the, 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 the quality that, uh, that, that gets the top dollar. Okay. And secondly, we want a plant that on the inside has good flesh. Okay. Especially now that uh, we have pro the processing industry growing up. That is those that are making sweet potato chips, sweet potato fries, uh, and, and, and Dr. Ku, one of our researchers, is doing sweet potato flour so that you can have uh, uh, those, uh, a, what, what do you, the cornbread with sweet potato flour mixed in it. But anyway, kind of emptying the bit. But uh, when we get inside the potato, okay, we want a potato that is deep in color inside. And by the way, this is Borgard. This is the variety that is commercially produced. We want a variety that is solid uh, in color, and one that doesn't have this much thick uh, uh, outer tissue. Uh, we, we call it the cambio tissue plus other tissues. Uh, and this happens when the potato has been planted over and over again. So we make that selection. We make sure that that plant has that, uh, that quality both inside and out. And then our biotechnology team uh, goes in and picks uh, the tips, the very uh, tip of the, uh, the growing potato vine. Okay? We call them the, the shoot tips. And the shoot tips, uh, those of you who understand, just a little bit biology, the very tip, there are few cells where the virus does not reach because the virus in the plant travels through the vascular system and the vascular system is not fully developed at the shoot tips. So that's where our biotechnology team goes in and picks those very tiny pieces of plants, and hopefully they scoop out what doesn't have a virus. And they grow that uh, in the tissue culture lab, they culture that, multiply that, and uh, the whole process to where they get that plant to a pot, okay? Now, that process uh, also requires continued monitoring to analyze to make sure that that plant is virus free. Once they determine that the plant is virus free and they get it to the plant, then we have to get it from the tissue culture lab to the greenhouse. Therefore, we have to acclimatize it, harden it, and so forth. And that's in the greenhouse. That's how the plant looks. And technically, that plant is virus free. Okay. And uh, we multiply that in the greenhouse. Now, viruses are transmitted by insects, white flies, aphids, and all that. So our greenhouse has insect screen to prevent any type of insect from going in and contaminating the plant before we get them to the field. So we do that stage, we multiply, and finally we get those slips out in the field. <coughs> At this point, those slaves are referred to as generation zero or G zero, okay? And some of you may have heard of G1, G2, and so forth, okay? G is just a generation of the growing season. We call it G zero because these slaves have not produced any potatoes since they left the greenhouse and since, not since they left the tissue culture lab, okay? And the moment we plant them in the field, they are now exposed to insects and viruses and all that. And they will get viruses. But then the virus accumulates over time, and we recommend to farmers that they can grow slips that they get, or potatoes they get from us, for three years. By the third year, they really need to have 
increase their uh, earlier generation plants because every year you get more and more virus in that plant since it's propagated vegetatively. Okay. Uh, and then uh, once you plant them, they grow out in the fields and we harvest them and uh, we then store them. Okay. So at this point, these plants, again, keep up with me. You go from the tissue culture to the greenhouse to the field, and now you have to harvest it. So this is the first crop of that virus-free plant. And therefore, we call these potatoes G1 potatoes, or generation one potatoes, okay? So uh, with potatoes, once we harvest them, we have to cure them, uh, and then after curing, we store them. That is. Uh, within uh, this is our old house, this is our new house, and in here we can cure them at a temperature of about 85 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with about 95 to 100 percent humidity. That's hot and humid, and we do that uh, for anywhere you know, from four days to about a week, uh, curing that. Okay. So when we do that, we want to make sure that any bruises uh, they heal and the sugar content in the potato also increases, okay? And once they are cured, they are ready for storage for months until we are ready to do whatever it is that we want to do with them, okay? Uh, and uh, this house can raise up the temperature up to about 95, almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and when they are cured, we can lower it down to 55, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the, the, the storage temperature. So it allows us uh, a lot of flexibility with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then when we get the potatoes to the farmers, basically those G1 potatoes are the ones that we sell to the slip producers, not farmers, slip producers. If you are to buy those G0 slips from those that, are, that produce them, it costs over a dollar a piece. A dollar, one slip. Okay, so they're expensive. So farmers who just want to grow the crop, it will not be a good business to buy G1. They want to buy from farmers who buy these G1 potatoes, grow the slaves uh, as the market, as a business, as a business, and that way those slaves are a little cheaper, okay? But once our contact farmers, slave producers buy the potatoes, they bear them out in the field, they get the slaves, and they uh, plant them, and they grow. I don't have time, I forgot about the system, but they plant them and so forth, okay? And the remaining minutes, okay? In addition to doing all this science and producing uh, all these potatoes, uh, UNPB, along with, with the Cooperative Extension Service, uh, do provide our sweet potato farmers with advice, with technical assistance. So we go out uh, in the field and visit the farmers who are growing these potatoes, and advise them accordingly. The most important thing, and that's what I always tell uh, vegetable producers, you have to keep up with your number of plants per acre. That's where your money is. With sweet potatoes, if you don't plant enough slips in the field, you undercut yourself even before you get further on. Okay. So we go in, uh, some gentleman here, uh, Dr. English, uh, anyway, we go in and assess the farmer's stand crop stand in the fields. And this is a good stand. You can see uh, slips doing very well every 12 inches. That's the distance between plants. Uh, and this is one that's not doing so well. And this particular farmer's field, there's a whole section here that has no slips. Okay? Now, if you recall back, about four, five potatoes per plant. You can imagine how many potatoes uh, he will miss just because of poor stand. And again, that goes into uh, the training the farmer has with the people, the crew that help him to plant. Okay? We also monitor uh, the insects. The Arkansas Plant Board, the Arkansas State Plant Board, monitors certain uh, insects that uh, do infect sweet potatoes, and they want to make sure that we're not bringing any foreign insects from other states to us. So our team also assists farmers in monitoring for that, in addition to what the state does. And uh, this one of our farmers, Mr. Williams, back there, and we're trying to make sure that we don't have the bad bugs uh, in there, okay? Uh, and finally, 
we monitor the nutritional aspects, the soil inputs. We don't want them to fertilize too much. Too much nitrogen may result to their situation. We want them to do something that is all to that. The big difference is, uh, again, this is a nicely looking, lush, growing field, okay? The farmer here had used too much nitrogen or followed sweet potato with a crop of that had high nitrogen. They grow too well, they are too happy, they have no reason to put roots, okay? So if you don't, if they don't follow the right input management, they end up with good plants but no good yield. But the plants may not look so good, but the yields are wonderful. So we help them in monitoring the, the input with that, okay? And then harvesting, I'll just skip through there. Uh, one of the happy farmers, his field was doing pretty good. Uh, and I will stop there with the cost. We also help them with management of cost returns, how much money they can realize out of an acre, and we estimate about 350 bushels per acre. Um, and if they get 60% of number ones, okay, they can realize that much money, over $4,000. If they don't get the number ones, again, it's all tied into the field management. Uh, they get almost half of that. Uh, and how do they lose the US number one? Sometimes it's the inputs, it's the, the way they manage the crop. Sometimes it's how they harvest. If a farmer doesn't have the right crew, uh, if they don't train them on the best way to harvest and what to pick, uh, then they can leave a lot of US number one in the field. They may just leave the money in the field. This was a field after harvest, okay? And you can see all those potatoes after the rains, you know, the saw exposes, whatever was left. That's a lot of potatoes. And that's a lot of money the farmer has left there. So in addition to uh, all the other inputs, we, we help them with understanding some of these issues. Uh, and again, cost analysis. And with that, I apologize for extra time. <laughs> Any questions? I don't know that. Yes. Yes. I want to know how long from you inoculated in the India until the transfer to the pot, how long? Oh, tissue culture from getting the explant, the shoot tips from the field uh, to getting the plant to the greenhouse? Yeah, how long? Um, okay. Uh, now, uh, let me, Dr. Panaya. Uh, he's here with us. That, that's our tissue catch, our biotech person. Uh, uh, you start getting the explants in the growing season. That is back in uh, June, July. Okay, that is for the plants that we are getting ready for this year. So it starts about June, July, and then from that time they get the shoot tips, and they've been working in the tissue catch lab, getting them to where now we just had them the last week or two. Uh, into the greenhouse. And now we're doing the multiplication in the greenhouse so that by the end of, May, end of March, April, we have the slips ready to go out the field. Yeah, so it takes about six months. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. We're going to Can have you? to go on to our next meeting. <laughs> okay. So okay. We'll and I'll be here. Uh, oh, you're welcome to visit with me after this. Thank you. All right, our next presenter is Dr. Leonard Gathenji. He's an extension horticultural specialist uh, for UAPB. And his project, the title of his project is the Strawberry Project Update. <clears throat> Dr. Yeah, uh, yeah, again, Leonard Gathenji, horticulture specialist at uh, UAPB. And uh, I think it's very simple. When you are going to give an update, it's kind of very brief, and uh, it's just to tell you what is happening with this project. And before I start, how many people are growing strawberries here? Anybody who is a strawberry grower? I've got one plant. One plant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good starting point. Still in the pot. That's a good starting <laughs> so point. So I'm growing strawberries in my house. <laughs> okay. Who plans sometime in the future to have, whether they are a few plants or to become a, you do? Very well, very well, very well. And uh, who is interested in educating producers how to grow strawberries? 
maybe folks around here, some, yeah, I see that. Yeah, so this is a kind of uh, an eye opener. Uh, this is a, a project that came about out of the legalization that uh, in Arkansas, we are not doing too well in terms of uh, production. Maybe we have so many people with just one plant of strawberry. <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, uh, how, any, anybody knows who, who are the leading producer, which state is the leading producer of strawberries, the one that you find in Walmart or wherever? Anybody? California. California, right, bingo. So California produces nearly all the strawberries that we find in the grocery stores because they produce at least 92% of total U.S. production. Then Florida, which is number two, produces 6%. So in total, two states produce how much percentage? 98. 98. So meaning that the less of uh, 48 states, we only produce 2%. Very bad news. And the bad news is that uh, for us to consume those uh, strawberries in Arkansas, which have to be shipped from either Florida or California, what's happening? They are tracking, they are bringing these uh, fruits with big, truck, big trucks, and what's happening? They are burning a lot of fossil fuel, which is not good for the environment. It's more expensive, it's not good for the environment. Therefore, Walmart Foundation came up with an idea of trying to solve this problem by giving funds through the, the Center of Agriculture and Rural Sustainability in order to help especially states that historically have low production to increase their strawberry production as well as uh, use sustainable practices. So that's the background of this uh, uh, project. So our goal at UAPB was actually to establish and expand strawberry production in eastern Arkansas and surrounding areas, uh, basically the Delta region. So the specific objectives uh, following the objective of the Walmart Foundation was to increase the season of growing strawberry. And you increase the growing season by investing in high tunnels, and we are going to talk about the high tunnels, the low tunnels, so that you can start your production early and you know, hopefully you're able to achieve higher production. Another objective was to reduce the chemical inputs because the other concern, especially at California, in California, they are using a lot of methyl bromide. Who has ever heard of methyl bromide? It's a, a few people have. Methyl bromide is, they thought it was a good product because if you use it in the soil, it's able to get rid of so many soil disease-causing microorganisms. Very good for that. However, it's very dangerous for users. It can hurt you. It also hurts the environment. So the whole world, people have decided they want to phase out methyl bromide. And what will be the replacement? We have to come up with ideas that will help us to still grow strawberries uh, uh, avoid some of those uh, diseases from the soil without using methyl bromide. So we are looking at uh, opportunities to use uh, sustainable practices in production. Also, to improve the quality and health of the soil. Uh, also, we don't want to use a lot of chemical fertilizers because they also affect the environment negatively conserve water and energy during the strawberry production. And one of the ways that we conserve water is to invest in drip irrigation, OK? And lastly, to reduce the risk of human pathogen on fresh berries. When, when, when people are harvesting the berries, we want to make sure that uh, they are doing it the right way. We have the so-called the good agricultural practices and good hardening practices to make sure that you don't contaminate what you are harvesting. So some of the activities that we have done, we have conducted workshops uh, at the field days. At, uh, we had a workshop. I don't know who had a chance of attending the one that we had on 18th of December. Anybody came for the strawberry workshop here? A few people, yeah. Maybe we need to do a better job of making sure that you all get to know that we have those uh, programs going on. So we conducted that workshop, and we plan to have future workshops at the uh, if you can have a, a, 
if you can sign your name before you leave so that you know, we can get your contact, we'd like to invite you to come for the future workshops. Then another uh, activity was to develop the demonstration sites for the season extension you see the high tunnels at the, the low tunnels, to conserve water using drip irrigation at plastic march, a soil quality improvement using the cover crops or crop residue, at the soil health improvement using a technique, I just want to call it ASD, and ASD is a technique whereby you put a carbon source, a rich carbon source in the soil, and in our case, we use the rice bran. Then you wet that soil, cover it with the plastic, and there is a process that we, go, we will take place called the anaerobic process. The organisms that can survive at the low oxygen will multiply, release chemicals that are supposed to harm the disease-causing organisms, as well as weeds, okay? So we did that. And finally, to develop a disseminate extension publication, we have some factories that will be coming up telling you how to grow uh, your strawberries. So let me share with you some of the things that are uh, you know, showing you with pictures, because pictures speak um, a thousand words. So this is one of the workshops that we had. I was here talking about the road tunnel production system, my attentive audience there. And then we had a field day, basically taking uh, the producers and educators to the field so that they can see what we do there. And here we are, we were using the road tunnels system in order to extend the growing season of strawberry. Now, this is the ASD I talked about. What do we did is that we laid out our experiment here, uh, flooded the soil, and you can see a lot of water standing on the soil and the, the plastic that covers uh, where we were going to plant strawberry. And this is a pictogram of how we put up our experiment. So what we did was that the place you see the red, those fields, we just use clear plastic in order to try and solarize the soil. Solarization means that uh, you cover the soil with clear plastic, you let the sun go through the clear plastic, heat the soil, retain the soil there, and hopefully the high temperature will kill those disease-causing organisms, microorganisms, okay? Then what you find in blue is the ASD, treating with a carbon source, rich carbon source, the rice bran. And then the one that you see in purple is where we combine solarization and ASD treatment, and then we had control in order to check whether our, how our system was working. Now, I don't know whether those pictures are clear, but what do you see? We just use a, a quadrant to sample what was happening. Uh, this is with regard to uh, the, the weeds, eh? But what do you find? How many weeds, plants can you find there? Anybody see any weeds? No, zero. Zero weeds. Solarization plus ASD, the result shows that we had zero weeds. ASD alone, again, how many weed plants? Zero. Now let's look at the control. Quite a bit of weeds, grasses, and the broad uh, leaf weeds. So in other words, Preliminary results showed us that those techniques, the ASD and uh, solarization combined with ASD, will actually help us to take care of the weeds as well as uh, the soil nematodes. I'm not presenting the results for the nematodes because I'm, I have not yet analyzed that because we are also interested in knowing whether these processes can take care of the soil nematodes. Now, this is a, a graph showing the results for the weed dry mass, we have said the weeds from that uh, square, and dry the weeds and weigh them. And you can see from on the right side, the ASD, the treatment that ha had ASD, you saw that they, were, they had zero weeds. Now, the clear plastic, this was a, a bit surprising. We thought that the clear plastic, because of solarization, the weed pressure was going to be low, but it was the highest. But then we realized what happened is that we did not do the correct timing 
because the supplies for this project came a little bit late. You are supposed to solarize during the summer when the temperatures are quite high, and you are supposed to solarize for at least three weeks, three to six weeks. <coughs> now, because of, we didn't have enough time, we came in with acrylic plastic quite late. So actually what happened is that it worked the opposite, just encouraging more seeds uh, to germinate, and therefore we had a problem with, the weeds, with this uh, experiment. But the, the control, you can see also, there is quite a bit of weeds. So this one tells you that in whatever situation, the ASD worked very well. And when we repeat the experiment, hopefully, solarization will also work maybe closer to ASD. Now, uh, I talked about the demonstration sites. Uh, and you saw this where we took the farmers during the field day. We are using the road tunnels. And again here, I could not capture the whole picture, but we are testing how the plants are going to perform under the high, the, under the road tunnel versus the control. And visually, we already can see that the plants under the high, the low tunnels are doing better than the ones under control. And then the high tunnel site, uh, this is when we started putting together uh, the high tunnel. Uh, it came up uh, with the on campus crew that were quite helpful, but uh, uh, we realized that the process of building the tunnels was going uh, quite slowly, so we got some consultant to help us finish the tunnels. And this is a picture that I took yesterday. It tells you that the tunnels, three of them, are almost ready. We have some strawberry plants coming next week that will go into the high uh, tunnel. And hopefully, uh, when we have uh, uh, a hands-on training exercise on how to grow strawberries under the high tunnel system, you all will come to visit our campus. Two minutes, I'm sure I'll handle it in the next two minutes, yeah. So the future activities, as I said, we have some workshops that are coming on, coming uh, uh, very soon. We have, we have a hands-on exercise on high tunnels, the one I talked about. I need you all, all of you to come. We have a field day on integrated pest management, as well as the use of beneficial insects, because we need those beneficial insects, such as bumblebees or honeybees, because being a fruit crop, strawberry needs pollinators. So we are going to have a workshop to explain all that. And then another workshop on food safety, good agricultural practices, and good harvesting practices, so that uh, uh, our expert will show you how to handle, how to harvest and handle the product to make sure that uh, we minimize that contamination I talked about. And uh, lastly, demonstration of better harvesting technique that minimize the damage of the berries because one of the problems we have with the berries, strawberries, because of their soft skin, if you don't handle them very well, you can damage them. And when you damage the fruit, what will happen? Start rotting and it's not good. It's not safe for our own consumption. So any comments or questions? No question. If you don't ask me questions, then I'll ask you questions. <laughs> eh? OK. You will not allow me to ask questions. I would have asked a few questions, what we learned today. But I hope you're all going to leave your names and contacts so that uh, we can invite you for, uh, for those uh, workshops. All right? Um, our final present presenter today is Dr. Pamela Moore. She's the Associate Director of Global Engagement at uh, UAPB. And the title of her presentation is the Global River Basin Initiative and Opportunities for Small Farmer Engagement. OK, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm probably the least technically proficient person here. I had to get a couple of instructions on uh, using this little attachment. Um, my presentation is um, a bit unique for the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences. Um, I'll be talking about a somewhat comprehensive uh, grant that we received from NEFA Capacity Building Grant Program. 
uh, but focusing more specifically on aspects in which we can engage our partners in uh, supporting technical and training assistance activities overseas. Uh, I do have a sign-in sheet that I'm willing to share with my other presenters, and um, I'm going to invite one of my international students to come and make sure this gets uh, disseminated. Genoa, you want to do that? Um, I want to acknowledge, I also serve as international student advisor, and I see I have a nice cohort of international students here, and I'm going to invite Pramod to come up and share these uh, handouts. And before I begin, I just want to acknowledge two other persons in the room. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do with this project is use it uh, as a foundation for growth and we've already established an advisory council. And two of our advisory council members are here, uh, Freddie Petit Brown, if you could raise your hand, and Freeman McKendra. Okay, I probably already used five minutes of my presentation, uh, so allow me to proceed. Um, I'm going to provide some background information on the initiative and then uh, share with you some tidbits about our West Africa Needs Assessment <clears throat> exercise. Um, let me begin by trying to respond to two questions. Uh, one, why create a Global River Basin Initiative? Um, well, the response is twofold. First of all, uh, we live in a rapidly globalizing society. Uh, the world is changing all around us and even throughout this region and geological, climactic, and cultural ways. Um, and we need to appreciate how that impacts our educational mission as a land-grant institution. Um, why this emphasis on a global river basin? Uh, to be honest, I just felt like we needed a hook. Uh, we, we live, uh, this is a very, um, in some respects, um, uh, rural, isolated region, and, uh, and even though we're being impacted by the world, the typical conception is that we don't have anything to do with these global things. They don't relate to us. And, uh, but we can all relate to the river, and uh, it impacts our lives in manifold ways. And outside of the U.S., the whole world is fascinated with the Mississippi River Basin, uh, even though we don't always appreciate that. Uh, capacity building, um, why we opted for a capacity building grant, why not just get out there and do it? Um, the challenges you face in that regard is that, first of all, um, internationalization does require how you think about what you do. It requires that you have different systems in place. Um, it requires a different mindset in how we teach, how we do research. Um, and so we thought that through a capacity building grant that would spur us to action, it would generate a number of these processes. I'm not going to talk so much about um, some of the other factors impacting um, this project. Here's a map of the Lower Mississippi River Basin. And we are, when we talk about, this is the Mississippi River Basin geologically, which may surprise some of our students because we typically think of the river as the basin. But the basin itself is huge. It covers almost half of the country but we are interested in this portion of that basin, uh, particularly the Arkansas Delta. Okay, I want to, um, now, the way we structured this particular grant, um, it's entitled From the Mississippi the Delta to the Niger Delta strengthening teaching extension uh, capacity um, at UAPB to enhance international programming. 
Uh, the Niger River Basin um, is situated, sorry, the Niger River Basin is situated across most of West Africa. It's a multi-country river, just like the Mississippi River is a multi-state river system. Um, the two countries that we're working with are Senegal and Nigeria. Our project, our international extension component is focused primarily in the Niger Delta River State Nigeria here. We included Senegal because we have a partner in Dakar called Wetlands International that actually works across this basin and in Nigeria. And when we conducted our NICE assessment exercise, we found ourselves learning about how the Senegal River Basin connects with the Niger River Basin. So you can see we're working in two locations where agriculture, water, river systems, managing floods, all these things are part a person's realities, the communities, the farmers who live there. This is just uh, another map of Nigeria. Uh, this is what they call the Niger Delta region in Nigeria. Here is River State where we're concentrating our project activity. There are actually three objectives in this project. Um, and Willie, I think I'd like for you to let me know when I have five minutes left rather than two. Uh, and two of the objectives really relate more to UAPB, uh, putting in place uh, internal processes to, to facilitate thinking out of the box um, and engaging in different activities. Objective one uh, involves setting up something like a funded committee or a funded working group where we bring persons from different faculties and disciplines together. We have a structured program whereby that group meets once a semester. We bring in speakers. Those speakers will be dealing with a wide range of topics from uh, water management and control to uh, rural development initiatives to the history of the region, what makes us unique. Uh, and one key thing that makes us unique is that through cotton production in the 1800s, uh, we were economically integrated into a global economic system far ahead of the rest of the country. So when we look at some of the challenges we face as educators, low educational attainment, uh, poor infrastructure. A lot of that has to do with that plantation history that allowed us to be economically productive in cotton production, but suppress manufacturing, uh, didn't provide an incentive for educating people. And now we're in a different era and we're struggling to overcome some of those barriers. One outcome of this group is that we will ask them to develop what we call a white paper or a strategy paper that speaks to the entire university community and says to us, this is what internationalization should look like for UAPB. Uh, the second objective I'm just going to touch on um, is designed, briefly is designed to provide funding to defray, um, it, well, it's designed to better systematize study abroad so we can get more students out of the country. So it includes everything from improving how we make financial aid available for study abroad, uh, putting in place uh, a how-to manual for faculty and staff, and then providing incentive grants to defray the cost of travel for uh, faculty members who want to organize group programs abroad. It, we don't provide 100% of the program, but we try to provide enough to uh, uh, make it easier for faculty and students to raise the money to travel abroad. Um, most of the resources of the grant are in this area. Um, this whole uh, area of strengthening international extension capacity. 
And uh, that is where the, um, the activity in um, the Niger Delta is uh, critical. What we're trying to do is put in place new partnerships in both Senegal and River State. Um, we have a partner, uh, we have working groups that we have established. Uh, we will be hosting some of those partners this summer. And by the end of the summer, we will have determined uh, what kind of demonstration initiative we want to do in rivers. And ideally, by the fall, we'll begin sending trainers and technical assistance providers over to help with the different projects. And one decision we made with this grant was that we wouldn't just limit these opportunities to faculty and staff, that once we know what this project looks like, we will look within our partner network internally and externally to find the best person to do the training. So it could be um, um, uh, one of our partners um, like Seven Harvest or uh, the Arkansas Delta Seeds of Change. It could be a small farmer with this expertise in a certain area. It could be a member of the extension staff working with women and youth. Um, but we, we won't know for sure until we finalize what this looks like. Okay, I haven't heard from Willie yet, so I'll use the rest of my time. I have five wow. minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some scenes from our West Africa needs assessment exercise that was conducted um, mid-September to early October of last year. <laughs> So three-person needs assessment team, myself, Dr. Garner, and Dr. Buckner. Uh, we spent about a week, about five days in Senegal and about 10 days in uh, River State. Um, when we talk about internationalization, changing how we work, uh, this trip was a good trial run. Uh, because we flew into Lagos, then to Dakar, back to Lagos, then down to Rivers, figuring out um, the costs in all these different currencies, trying to anticipate uh, baggage fees, uh, putting in place a new approach to get our project materials to Rivers once we realized the baggage fees would be more than the cost of the ticket. All these things required working really closely with our administrative team to make sure that we didn't blow our budget <laughs> and get in trouble. Um, so when we talk about internationalization, it's not just what happens in the classroom, but how all these systems support what we're trying to do. Um, on campus, you walk into our office and you see two people and some students running around. Uh, that doesn't really reflect the complexity complexity of our new um, operation because we now have partners in, um, in Dakar, uh, approximately three persons with Wetlands International are members of our project staff. Uh, they have to write reports, they have to, they, they were responsible for putting in place the logistics uh, the various activities that took place, um, visits into the um, Senegal River um, Basin, where we were meeting with various partners. This is uh, an organization that does uh, community-based small farmer technical assistance and training. Um, they have uh, dorm facilities on site. Um, that you can see in the background. And uh, they also have demonstration farms and activities uh, where they work with small farmers in that region. And this is a rice uh, production, rice field, and uh, an, irrigation, an irrigation pump here. Um, these are just some roadside scenes. We didn't have much success with some of the research centers because typically in Africa, there's a strong distinction between research and extension. So people doing research 
don't really get involved in getting that technology to the small farmer. So it's, those discussions were more theoretical. But we were warmly received by Gaston Berger University, and they are very much interested in a linkage partnership um, where we can perhaps engage more closely with them uh, on some of our activities. And then um, we spent most of our time in River State. Uh, this is an initial meeting with the governor of that state where you can see he got his little golden lion. That was very important. <laughs> and um, he is a um, non-traditional leader for Nigeria. Uh, he's in an oil producing state and uh, he said early on he's going to make sure the money goes to the people and uh, he's building schools, he's investing in agriculture. Uh, we were we were able to visit all these